Chief Secretary, Mr. Padi, the additional Chief Secretary, Mr. Balakrishnan, Honorable Ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start, I really wish to thank the organizers for having invited me to this lecture series. And thanks are also due to Shri Subrotha Bhakti for having recommended my name. Uh, because this gives me a platform to share some of my views with such a distinguished audience which is seated here and also those that are participating via the audio and video link which has been set up for this presentation. You know, it's, it's always easy to ideate, slightly more difficult is to plan and uh, to execute, that really is the key. And I am privileged because I'm speaking with the lot which actually translates policy into action on the ground. And thank you once again for having me over. Uh, what I've done is I've uh, put together a presentation. So uh, I put together this presentation it basically into uh, three parts and uh, the first of course is uh, how and why in the sense that how do we train for space flight and uh, whatever we do during that training process why was it needed in the first place why do we train in that manner I shall attempt to bring out the reasons which uh, necessitates such an approach, the, the training philosophy. So next uh, I shall cover an attempt to explain why we need to continue our efforts in space. What are those compelling reasons? And if we are to continue, do we keep following the same model as we have done up till now? Or make some changes. Finally, I wish to share with you some of my learnings that have taken place during this journey. So let's begin at the beginning. What you see here is a centrifuge. Now I think before we go on to the uh, mechanical construction of this uh, contraption, uh, just let's revisit a bit of physics and uh, if you're traveling in a car at a high speed and you jam on the brakes you get thrown forward what you're experiencing is the force of deceleration the opposite of that is the force of acceleration so if you are driving say an Audi Q7 and then you hit the pedal on the floor and the car kind of takes off, you get pushed into the seat. Really, that is forward acceleration. Now, at the time of launch, the cosmonauts and the astronauts are placed on their backs and they are facing the sky because the effect of acceleration is that it pulls the blood out of your head towards your lower extremity. And when that happens, there is a feeling of grey out and uh, if it's allowed to continue, there is a blackout and it incapacitates the pilot. So uh, we are made to lie down. This reduces the shift from the frontal area towards the back and it increases your tolerance of the G threshold. And G happens because you are being accelerated from zero to an orbital velocity of close to eight kilometers per second. And you do all this in about eight minutes. And uh, that is why the acceleration is of a very high order. Now, of course, um, in fighter aircraft, uh, you pull, uh, you experience uh, all the way up to nine times the force of gravity. And, uh, but that is for a very short period of time because you run out of energy 
the aircraft is incapable uh, of providing so much energy that you can continue to be at that high g-force for a longer period. So that lasts for a very short time. The problem in space flight is that when uh, you're launching, this force, which stays on for eight minutes, keeps pushing you into your seat, although the, you don't experience more than four times the force of gravity, but it lasts for the entire eight minutes. And uh, what it does is that if you're weighing 60 kilos at one G, when you double the force of gravity, you weigh 120 kilos. And at four times the force of gravity, you weigh 240. Every component of your body weighs four times. So your rib cage presses towards your spine, leaving no space for your lungs to expand. Breathing becomes difficult. So you train for that kind of a thing in this, in the uh, centrifuge. The centrifuge essentially is a long mechanical arm uh, pivoted right in the middle and the whole thing is turned around at very high speeds. Uh, very miniature versions of this probably be able to see in path labs uh, where they utilize the centrifugal uh, principle to separate uh, those cells from the plasma. And uh, so we were put into this and we were moved up to eight to nine uh, times the force of gravity for longer periods of time to, for them to determine what is our actual threshold. And they were waiting to see who passes out at how many seconds uh, while sustaining the high G forces. That was needed because in the case of a launch abort, if you are going to be returned back to Earth, you are going to be experiencing more than 4 Gs for much longer. So they established that threshold for each trainee uh, cosmonaut in this particular facility. So this is why we did a lot of work on two, the uh, uh, centrifuge. And next, of course, was vestibular training. Now, the centrifuge trained us to handle more G-forces. The vestibular apparatus and vestibular training trained us for zero gravity. Because you, are exp you leave from one gravity on Earth, you transit into space at about four gravities for eight minutes, and when you end up, you end up with zero gravity instantaneously from four to zero. Now, when there is no gravity, there is no weight acting on your feet. On Earth, I'm able to stand vertical because if I start leaning to one side, because of my weight shifting to the right side of the foot, there is a feedback and I'm able to correct myself. And there are semicircular canals inside my head which are mutually perpendicular to each other, giving me orientation in the three axes. When you're in space, when there's no weight acting on your feet, you cannot stand vertical. In that, indeed, there's no need to stand vertical because you don't fall. There is no roof. The concept of uh, floor and roof ceases to exist. So you're quite comfortable floating around. But when you do that, your head keeps moving around. And when the head moves, the semicircular canals get churned up. And that is what causes space sickness. So the idea of this particular training was to condition your vestibular system to prepare it for those conditions of zero gravity where your head will be moving around, you will not be vertical, you'll be floating. And the training was given by placing you on a chair, strapped up, this picture shows my colleague and backup uh, Ravish Malhotra undergoing that training, fully strapped in to the chair. The chair is made to go around, spin around its axis, and you're going around and around. And while the chair is going around, 
you're, so you're required to move your head in these three directions, forward and back, shoulder to shoulder, left to right. So that in turn, you are stimulating those three semicircular canals. Initially, when you start the training, you can't sit in this torture chamber for more than two to three minutes. Yeah, but as you gain experience and your vestibular system gets conditioned, it goes on longer and longer and uh, you're able to tolerate more. The other thing that happens in zero gravity is that um, on Earth, the heart is required to pump blood against gravity so that it can reach your head. And the blood which is going down with gravity towards your lower extremities needs to come up at sufficient pressure so that it reaches the heart so that this loop can continue. <coughs> now, in eight minutes, you're translocated into an environment of zero gravity and nobody's told the heart that you're now in space. So the heart continues to pump at the old rate. And when it does so, blood starts collecting in the head because there's too much of blood which is going up into the head. What does it do? Your tongue swells up, okay? You feel feverish and blood, extra supply of blood to your semicircular canals, they get even more sensitive whereas the need for them is to be de desensitized because you, you can't hold your head. So this is a very important part of the training. Tilt table teaches the body how to handle extra blood flow for longer and longer periods of time. And again, it's a calibrated approach. So the head is tilted down, initially 20 degrees, then 40 degrees for longer periods of time. In fact, our beds uh, in the quarantine facility before our launch uh, had our feet propped up and the head, the pillow much lower than, than, the, than the legs. So, so this is what, why uh, tilt table training was required. Finally, the only way to replicate zero gravity on Earth is to take you up in an aircraft and uh, it's a huge transport aeroplane and it's made to dive then as it gathers speed it's pulled up stands on its tail and then as the speed washes off the autopilot pushes the nose forward and you describe a parabolic arc so for about 25 seconds conditions of zero gravity exist within that aircraft and this shot is, is how you get to feel for the first time what zero gravity is, but only for about 25 seconds at a time. So in one particular sortie, you, you do these cycles about 16 or 17 times. You're all wired up, so in case you have any latent physiological problems, they're supposed to come out and, and you also get weeded out of the training program. Uh, the other part is a lot of work is done on the simulators, a relatively benign environment where you can sit and practice your procedures. So if you look through the window where these three guys are sitting, the three guys are the instructors, and uh, through the window there is a capsule, which is a one is to one scale model of the capsule you'll be traveling in. And over there, as a crew, crew coordination, who does what, when, during the sequence. So we practice all that. And these three guys are the ones who monitor all your actions on the bank of uh, TV screens on top. And then they play around with those red buttons to give you emergencies. They put in smoke or the fire alarm, you know, and, that's, and then they... they, they uh, find out how you coordinate as a crew and what is your reaction time and whether or not your actions were correct and as per the book. So simulator work was done in this manner. I'd explain to you that you're under G-forces for a, for a longer period of time. Now, <clears throat> this means that if the seat is not customized for your fit, 
you're going to have some very painful extremities at the end of those eight minutes when your body is weighing four times than it otherwise does and you're pushed into that seat. So each seat is manufactured as per the body contour of the cosmonaut who's going to be using it. So they start with an empty aluminum shell, lower you into it in your long johns, and then pour hot gypsum around you. Well, warm gypsum, not enough to scald you. But, and as it starts setting, they winch you up vertically. So what you leave behind is your curvaceous imprint, which then becomes the uh, template for them to make a spongy layer which fits into the seat. So you have a customized seat which uh, gives you comfort for longer periods of time when you're pushed into it. And that is, so this uh, is where you first have a look and dress up the, the chair which is going to then move into the capsule. This is about two or three days before the launch and we are already in the quarantine facility. And uh, after this, of course, uh, the launcher itself is assembled in the assembly, vehicle assembly building and is moved uh, on a railroad uh, to the launch site, which is some distance away. And it takes all night for this journey because it moves rather slowly. And it is about 13 to 14 stories high. Uh, and in this case, 14 stories long. And it moves to the launch pad. At the launch pad, it is made to stand up vertically. And if you look at the needle-like structure right on top, that is the escape apparatus. And in the event of a problem, that is supposed to extract the capsule, which is right at the top, at the 13th floor level, and extract the capsule and take it away from the launch site, thus making it a survivable accident. In fact, as part of our training in December, uh, of, I launched in April, and in December, as part of the training, they wanted us to watch uh, launch live. And while we were watching it, the whole launcher exploded on the launch pad. And uh, <laughs> so they were quite embarrassed because, you know, it, it doesn't do much for the confidence of the next crew. <coughs> so, but what we saw and what gave me comfort was the fact that the escape system worked. So we saw the escape system firing. It extracted the capsule moved the cosmonauts about two kilometers, one and a half, two kilometers away from the launch pad while the launcher was burning, all the fuel had caught fire and these guys survived. And in fact, the uh, engineer flew with us because in the interim, I launched in April, in the interim, my engineer had a medical problem and he had to opt out of the crew. So, so after it is put up like this, then on the day of the launch, we move to the, get into the spacesuits, move towards the launch pad, take an elevator, go all the way up to 13 floors, fit into our customized seats and start our whole uh, pre-launch checklist one by one. It takes about two and a half hours. And then it's launch time or show time as you would like. Uh, point to note here is that Inside, you're blind because of the shroud which is covering the windows of the capsule. It needs to be so because you want to offer a clean aerodynamic profile. You don't want any extra drag while the launcher is moving out of the denser layers, uh, layers of the atmosphere. So that is why it is covered in that fashion. It's only after you clear the atmosphere that these parts fall off. So sitting inside, you're, the only cues you have is a whole lot of noise and a whole lot of vibration. And because this is now uh, on its own and weighing a couple of hundred tons, uh, and you're right on top, the 
the control system is fighting to keep it vertical and going in the right direction and the pendulous effect you know 13 stories up is swinging and 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 you're just hoping that you know you don't want to move even a little bit to make it more difficult for the for the control system so so it's a it's a it's a portion of the flight which is pregnant with possibilities but it it went on and everything went off rather well and from this point onwards the g forces build up for which we had already trained and uh, and uh, 8 minutes later you're in orbit and then after about a day and a half you go and dock with the laboratory which is already in orbit so here is a shot of the capsule the cosmonauts are seated in the capsule and the capsule is coming to dock with the laboratory there are those three antennas white things you can see they are radar antennas and they they keep giving in real time the uh, displacements from the norm in the three axes and if it exceeds the the limits prescribed which are etched onto our tv screens then you are supposed to take over manually and complete the docking procedure uh, manually but again that didn't happen and uh, everything worked rather well this gives you an idea this is a workplace in space gives you an, an idea of how messy it is and this is what happens when we know we are not being watched but of course before the interviews and all uh, we, we spruce it up like we do uh, our own homes before some visitors come in so this is one and uh, here is a, a shot for you uh, dinner is in progress commander is right side up I'm upside down both are equally comfortable and we are having dinner only thing is that you got to make sure that between morsels you put your dinner under an elastic strap otherwise it flies away from you so so this is just to give you a sense of how life is lived in an orbit this is the view from space uh, it's very very different I, I will let me say it's not much different from what you see from aircraft but the point to note is that the sky is black if you see the top right uh, part of the screen that is the sky you are flying above the atmosphere and therefore uh, there is the blackness of space and that is uh, where you're flying so what is clearly visible are coastlines and uh, and this probably is a good time to tell you why India looks so good from space because we have such a brilliant coastline we have uh, the ghat section which are green we have uh, the plateaus the Deccan plateau which gets brownish then we move into the Gangetic plains which are green again then we have the deserts of Rajasthan which appear golden move further north and you're into the foothills of the Himalayas and those peaks and the sun is unable to penetrate those those deep troughs and the valleys and they look purple and the uh, caps uh, you know are snow clad so it's a very very pretty sight Africa the continent also looked very beautiful from space so here you are looking out the window and uh, against the black sky you first see that your solar panel uh, has become golden and uh, while you're still looking at it very very quickly while you're watching you start seeing that the rim of the earth as described by that blue curve you know the sun is kind of there's some light it's, it's backlit the earth is backlit and you're still you're moving into a sunrise and this is sunrise when seen from space and the great thing about this is that if you miss it you have to wait only 90 minutes to see it again because 
It takes 90 minutes to go around once. And if you hang on there for 45 minutes, you see this whole scene in reverse, which is the sunset. So you're, you're never short of this experience, except that one never had the time to, to see this. We are always at work. So here I come to the point that uh, we finish the flight, we collect all the data, uh, move it back into the uh, capsule and uh, undock from the laboratory and start returning back to Earth. You are being held in orbit because you're going at a particular velocity, eight kilometers per second. To get back to Earth, to allow the Earth's gravity to pull you down, you need to slow down. So the engines which have put you there are now used to decelerate you. So you turn around and now when you fire those engines, instead of accelerating, it decelerates you. Enough for you to not be able to sustain your orbit. So you now start coming back to Earth. And this time, your windows are open. And when you come in, as you're coming lower and lower, you are being braked only by the shape of your capsule. So the, as you encounter denser and denser layers of the atmosphere as you're coming lower and lower, the skin friction is high enough to start burning up the capsule. Except that there is a, an ablative uh, heat shield, so it exposes the heat shield. The first layer singes, burns, flies off. Second layer starts singeing and this carries on. And you are then at that, in that period of re-entry, you're unable to see outside the window because you're covered in flames. And it, this carries on like this till you reach about 30,000 feet, when at 30,000 feet automatically the parachute opens. And that little black dot below the parachute is the capsule, which by now is charred, is black in color. And uh, from 30,000 feet, of course, you have no control over where the winds will take you. We missed a lake and uh, we came to uh, came, uh, touch down on, on the Kazakh steps. And, but just before, two or three meters before the capsule touches the ground, there is a retro rocket which fires to slow, slow the craft down and it then settles uh, over there. So, in a nutshell, this has been uh, um, an eight-day journey for which one trained for 18 months. And uh, this leads us to uh, the next slide, which is, uh, I would say that uh, we must now think that we are done with near-Earth orbit work. What next? Where do we go from here? So that is where is the segment of the future of space exploration, which I would like to cover. And uh, first, I think we need to look at the drivers. And uh, the first driver would be the urge to explore. You see, exploration is a part of our DNA. Now, Everybody says that planet Earth is the cradle of our civilization. Uh, yes, it is, but nobody stays in the cradle for long. So you, you do move out. So it is written that we are explorers by nature and we will explore. And none know this better uh, than the people from Odisha, I would say because you have such a, had such a rich maritime culture and uh, this tradition of reaching far out eastwards and uh, you took with yourselves our prized culture and seeded those lands there. So now that we already have a spaceport at uh, Srihavikota, it perhaps uh, would be fitting that the next spaceport, say, for the first commercial flight happens from Chandipur in, in Odisha. So let's, let's hope for that. And uh, so we need to find out what lies beyond our shores. It's part of the tradition, especially here. And next, of course, is the 
search for resources to fuel our global economy, which is overheated. And you well know that it is going to remain like that for quite some time. And I don't see any change happening because our current model is, uh, economic model is such that uh, we are not going to slow down and we will run out of resources sooner rather than later. Because our economy, we've organized it in such a way that financially it's self-perpetuating in the short term, but in the long run, it's quite self-defeating. But we will come to that later. Uh, then there is environmental degradation of planet Earth, bad land use practices, the plundering of rainforests, clearly visible from space. Here again, I uh, will not include Odisha because the forest cover has increased uh, in the state, which is, which is wonderful to hear. And uh, so industrial and vehicular pollution, toxic rain, you name it, we have it. By we, I mean planet Earth is dealing with it. And uh, finally, uh, survivability. You know, we take good care to back up our computer data, but we have no backup for the human genome. And uh, tomorrow, if we make ourselves extinct because of our consumption patterns, we we are going to cease to exist. So, or if that doesn't happen, there are asteroids. Now we know they are out there. We have the capability of seeing which asteroid is heading which way and which one threatens us and by when will we be hit. And this time, if you are going to be hit by an asteroid, it's not the dinosaurs who are going to go. It is we, as a species, will cease to exist. So there is some work which needs to be done in that area. So let's look at the background of, uh, of space exploration. And, uh, and let's look at what has happened in the last century. The human population has quadrupled. And as usually happens, that when the human population increases, there are that many more mouths to feed. So generally, what happens is that the food requirements go up. And this has begun to lead into bad land use practices, um, over-exploitation of the land, fertilizers, insecticides, and uh, you know stuff like that. So this is, what, this is the next reason for where we are and why we are there. The other thing is that urban employment opportunities have begun to grow. Now, that is good news. But the downside is that we are creating uh, an aspirational society and we are enabling them to realize those aspirations. Unfortunately, those aspirations are the model followed by the developed world. But we'll come to that later. And uh, this increasing purchasing power uh, is going to result in affluent and more importantly, in energy intensive uh, lifestyles. So we see that consumerist culture has begun to take root. And uh, Snap Deal, Amazon, Diwali, fall collection, winter collection, we are all caught up in this and uh, this is going to go, carry on for some time. And when that happens, the demand has to be supplied and the markets have begun to flood with products that are not green. Polluting industries from the west have begun to relocate eastwards because there's a lack of 
environmental regulation here or where the regulation is there, there's a lack of enforcement. Also, what has happened is that product cost in the West is becomes high because they have to follow these environmental laws and it gets added on to the cost of the product. And that is why those industry, polluting industries, so why not go to a place where you can continue making the same stuff without paying the penalty of environmental regulation. So think Bhopal, think questionable food items which are flooding our market. So that's the other thing. And remember that energy sources being utilized both for manufacture as well as use of these appliances and electronic goods mostly are non-renewable. So what will happen? The Earth's non-renewable resources will rapidly deplete to sustain the affluent lifestyles, especially in our geography. And uh, I would say that the Earth cannot really support non-sustainable development. I would like you to imagine the combined populations of India and China, both having the wherewithal to buy stuff which is now available at the market. And obviously, you cannot have a government which will be able to control the spending habit of its people. If it does, then it cannot hope to get re-elected anyway. Because, and that's what is in our head. We've got to be, you know, as well to do as our developed world counterparts. So this cannot go on for much longer. So, all of us will need to find another habitable home planet, is what I feel. Now, if we do that, are we going to change our whole paradigm? Or are we going to continue living like that? Even if we go to find another home planet, are we going to repeat the same mistakes? I think we should be working towards making heaven right here on earth, rather than a far off hell as shown there. So we need to change some things here. Now, to come to the learning which I've had along the way. And here, I must start with a disclaimer. You know, I'm, I'm no gyani or a guru, uh, so some of my conclusions here are really based on my personal experience. They worked for me and I'm merely sharing them with you, so don't take it otherwise. The first one is that we must grab every opportunity that comes our way, even if it appears to be out of our reach. Time and time again, when I looked at something which was offered to me and I felt that I don't think I can do it, time and time again I found that I was wrong in thinking so. Yeah, because there, there was the stubborn half of me said that, okay, let me at least try it. So having tried it, I've always discovered that things are not half as difficult as they appear to be when viewed from the outside. So I think every opportunity should be grabbed. Second is that the potential of young India, and I've interacted with a lot of them, I think that is immense and we must have a way to harness that and leverage it for our country. I've seen a lot of areas where specialized activity has never been left to specialists. And I think this is something which is most essential for doing things right the first time. And in the kind of tech space we are moving towards, Really, there's, there's no chance for failures. Although, innovation by itself, paradoxically, we must encourage failures because without failures, there is no innovation. So it, it is a tightrope walk, and I hope 
we should we do it well. And I would now say that the surest recipe for success is to let your purpose be higher than yourself. Because here again I found that when we do that, we seem to discover well, you know, a seemingly inexhaustible reserve of energy and we find that energy and that really comes to our aid and we are able to, to do what we otherwise may not have achieved. And the other thing I learned is that planet Earth, when viewed from space, it gives new meaning to the Vedic expression of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. The Earth is one family and this is how it looks, as you can see. I would here like to bring in the words of the Saudi astronaut, Prince Salman bin Sultan Abdulaziz. He said that when all of us go out into space for the first time, we first look at our own countries. And having seen our countries, then we notice that you know, there, are, there are no borders. And by the third or fourth day, we are looking at the Earth as a whole. So, so that's, that's the other learning. The way we are all integrated, it's not only our economies, I think our destinies are also integrated. Lastly, I feel that we must learn to be ourselves. Uh, it's got blanked out, but I was like any other kid when I was growing up, I wanted to be smart, be seen as a, a, a suave, interesting guy, you know. And, but as I kept growing along and I found that it was becoming a millstone around my neck, and I found that I was spending a lot of energy trying to be who I wanted to be seen as rather than who I actually am. And that learning was so liberating that I found that I freed up a lot of my bandwidth the moment I stopped uh, trying to be who I actually was not. So be yourself, I think, is, is a very important learning and this is what I got uh, during this journey of mine. And just to share with you Brené Brown's uh, statement, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. What I wanted to say was that uh, I really am privileged to have been uh, born and brought up into this uh, inclusive culture of ours, the Indian culture. It has always motivated me to raise myself, to always remain worthy of it. And this brings me to, the, to my opening statement. Ideating is easy, planning slightly less so, but the key is execution. And that this is what will return us to our former glory and return we must, for our culture equips us to be inclusive, unlike many other cultures we see and which really are the cause for conflict uh, globally. So, although we must act national, we must, I think, think global. And you, the audience, I think, will be playing a crucial role in making that happen. I wish all of you Godspeed in your endeavors. Jai Hind. Thank you.